Mr. Flynn, you may proceed now. Chief Justice, <clears throat> may it please the court, this case concerns itself with the conviction of a defendant of two crimes of rape and kidnapping, sentences on each count of 20 to 30 years to run concurrently. I should point out to the court in an effort to avoid possible confusion that the defendant was convicted in a companion case of the crime of robbery in a completely separate and independent act. However, the Supreme Court of the State of Arizona treated that con uh, conviction as a companion case in a companion decision, and portions of that record have been appended to the record in this case as it bears on the issue before the court. Now, the issue before the court is the admission in, in evidence of the defendant's confession under the facts and circumstances of this case over the specific objection of his trial counsel that it had been given in the absence of counsel. The trial court in June of 1963, prior to this court's decision in Escobedo, <coughs> allowed the confession into evidence. The Supreme Court of the State of Arizona in April of 1965, after this court's decision in Escobedo, affirmed the conviction and the admission of the confession in evidence. This court has granted us review. The facts in the case indicate that the defendant was a 23-year-old Spanish-American extraction that on the morning of March 13, 1963, he was arrested at his home, taken down to the police station by two officers named Young and Cooley. That at the police station, he was immediately placed in a lineup. He was there identified by the prosecutrix in this case and later identified by the prosecutrix in the robbery case. But immediately after the interrogations, he was taken into the police confessional at approximately 11.30 a.m. And by 1.30, they had obtained from him an oral confession. Well, what's a police confessional? The interrogation room, uh, described in the transcript as interrogation room number two, Your Honor, please. He had denied his guilt, uh, according to the officers, at the commencement of the interrogation. By 1.30, he had confessed it. I believe that the record indicates that at no time during the interrogation and prior to his confession, his oral confession, was he advised either of his rights to remain silent, of his right to counsel, or of his right to consult with counsel. <coughs> Nor indeed was such the practice in Arizona at that time as admitted by the officers in their testimony. <coughs> the defendant was then asked to sign a confession, to which he agreed. The form handed to him to write on contained a type statement as follows, which precedes his handwritten confession. I, Ernest A. Miranda, do hereby swear that I make this statement voluntarily and of my own free will, with no threats, coercion, or promises of immunity, and with full knowledge of my legal rights, understanding any statement I make may be used against me. This statement was read to him by the officers, and he confessed in his own handwriting. Writing. Throughout the interrogation, the defendant did not request counsel at any time. In due course, the trial court appointed counsel to defend him in both cases, and defense counsel requested a psychiatric examination, which has been made a port, the, and the medical report has been made a portion of the transcript of the record in this case, as it enlightens us to a portion or some of the factual in information surrounding the defendant. Mr. Flynn, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but you said that he was not, uh, that Miranda was not uh, told that he might remain silent. Did you say that? That is correct. Uh, is there a Honor. dispute as to that? Yes, there is, Your Honor, and I believe it arises as a result of the appendix and the robbery uh, conviction. In this re respect, I would answer Your Honor's question by referring to page 51 of the petitioner's brief and to the appendix, or excuse me, page 52. At the top, which the question was asked by Mr. Moore, the trial counsel, 
Did you state to the defendant at any time before he made the statement you are about to answer to that anything he said would be held against him? Answer, no, sir. Question, you didn't warn him of that. Answer, no, sir. Question, did you warn him of his rights to an attorney? Answer, no, sir. Mr. Moore, we object, not voluntarily given. Mr. Turoff, I don't believe that is necessary. The court overruled. On page 53, succeeding page, a portion of the same record indicates further, cross -exam further examination concerning this conversation. Had you offered, and starting approximately one-third down the page, had you offered the defendant any immunity? Answer, no, sir. In your presence, had Officer Cooley done any of these acts? Answer, no, sir. Question, about what time did this conversation take place, officer? Answer, approximately 1.30. Shortly after Mrs. McDaniels made her first statement, is that correct? Answer, yes, sir. Can you tell us now, officer, regarding the charge of robbery, what was said to the defendant and what the defendant answered in your presence? Answer, I asked Mr. Miranda if he recognized, and there the question terminates. Well, I, 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 I was referring to page four of your brief in which you say that Officer Young believes that Miranda was told that he need not answer their questions. Uh, I was about to continue, uh, if Your Honor, please, to page 54, in which we find question, you never warned him he was entitled to an attorney or anything he said would be held against him, did you? Answer, we told him anything he said would be used against him. He wasn't required by law to tell us anything. Now, consequently, this would answer Your Honor's question, except bearing in mind that the record clearly reveals that from the lineup and the identification to the interrogation room, the officers established the time as 11.30, and that the confession was completed and signed at 1.30, Reading the testimony of the robbery conviction, it is apparent to me that the officers, when they recite or answered on page 54 of the transcript that he'd been advised of his rights, were again relating to this formal type heading, which would be at 1.30 at the time he signed the confession. That hence, there really is no conflict in the record as to when he was advised of his rights. <coughs> The further uh, history relating to this defendant found in the psychiatric examination would indicate that he had an eighth grade education and is found by the Supreme Court that he had a prior criminal record and that he was mentally abnormal. He was found, however, to be competent to stand trial and legally sane at the time of the commission of the alleged acts. Now, the critical aspect of the defendant's case of confession, I think, is eminently demonstrated when during the trial the prosecutrix was asked the question concerning penetration in which she first responded that she, was, that she thought it was by finger under questioning by the prosecuting attorney. Immediately thereafter she expressed uncertainty as to the manner or method of penetration and after some prompting responded to the prosecuting attorney that it had been in fact by the male organ. On cross-examination she again expressed the uncertainty in relation to this penetration, which of course is the essential element of the crime of first degree rape in the state of Arizona, when she did, responded to his question that she simply was unsure whether it had been by finger or by penis. Now of course the defendant's confession neatly corrects this reasonable doubt that otherwise would have been engendered when in precise terminology he wrote, asked her to lie down and she did could not get penis into vagina, got about one half, parenthesis, half written, inch in. The only thing missing, or the only thing that the officers failed to supply in words to this defendant at the time he wrote this confession was in violation of section 13-611, Arizona revised statutes. And then of course they would have had the classic confession of conviction because they could have argued that the man even knew the statutory provisions relating to rape. The state, as I read their response, take no issue with the statement of facts as I've outlined them to this court, except to say that we overstate his mental condition and, mi and minimize his educational background. And also the concern that is expressed uh, by Mr. Justice Fortas concerning 
at what stage of the proceeding he may have been advised of his right to remain silent. Now, the petitioner's position on the issue is simply this. The Arizona Supreme Court, we feel, has imprisoned this court's decision in Escobedo on its facts. And by its decision, is refusing to apply the principles of that case, and for all practical purposes, has emasculated certainly every court desiring to admit a confession can find distinguishing factors in Escobedo from the fact situation before it. I would like to very briefly quote from the transcript of record, which contains the Arizona decision at page 87. Will, will be noted that the court in the Escobedo case set forth the circumstances under which a statement would be held admissible. Namely, one, the general inquiry into an unsolved crime must have begun to focus on a particular suspect. Two, the suspect must have been taken into police custody. Three, the police in its interrogation must have elicited an incriminating statement. Four, the suspect must have requested and been denied an opportunity to consult with his lawyer. Five, the police must not have effectively warned the suspect of his constitutional rights to remain silent. When all of these five factors occur, then the Escobedo case is a controlling precedent. Now, the Arizona Supreme Court, having built or having indicated its clear intention to imprison the, dis the Escobedo decision, set about to do it precisely that. First, as to the focusing question, it indicated that this crime had occurred at night. And consequently, despite the positive identification of the defendant by two witnesses, which the state urged were entirely fair lineups, the Supreme Court of Arizona indicated that even then, perhaps under these facts, attention had not focused upon this defendant. I think this is sheer sophistry and would clearly indicate the obvious intent of the Arizona Supreme Court to confine Escobedo and to distinguish it whenever possible. Next, the court found that the defendant was advised of his rights in the reading of the type portion immediately preceding its transcript. They permitted that document to lift itself by its own bootstraps, so to speak, and to indicate that here was a man who was knowledgeable concerning his legal rights, despite the facts and circumstances of his background and his education. And they further found that he was knowledgeable because he had a prior criminal record. So in the decision, they indicated this would be knowledge of his rights in court, and certainly not his rights at the time of the interrogation. I think the numerous briefs filed in this case, indicating the substantial split in the decisions throughout the various states, the circuits, and the federal district courts, indicate the interpretation that has been placed upon Escobedo. On the one hand, we have the California decision in Dorado. We have the Third Circuit's decision in Russo, which would indicate the principle and logic are being applied to the decision, and that the words of Mr. Justice Goldberg, that when the process shifts from the investigation to one of accusation, and when the purpose is to elicit a confession from the defendant, then the adversary process comes into being. On the other hand, the other cases that would distinguish this have found and give rise to what I submit is not really confusion by merely straining against the principles and logic in that decision. What do you think is the result of the adversary process coming into being when this focusing takes place? What follows from that? Is there then a right to a lawyer? I think that the man at that time has the right to exercise, if he knows, under the present state of the law in Arizona, if he's rich enough, and if he's educated enough to assert his Fifth Amendment right, and if he recognizes that he has a Fifth Amendment right to request counsel. I simply say that at that stage of the proceeding, under the facts and circumstances in Miranda, of a man of limited education, of a man who certainly is mentally abnormal, who is certainly an indigent, that when that adversary process 
uh, came into being that the police, at the very least, had an obligation to extend to this man not only the, his clear Fifth Amendment right, but to afford to him the right of counsel. Well, I suppose if you really mean what you say or what you gather from, the Esco from what the Escobedo opinion says, if the adversary process uh, starts at that point, then every single protection of the Constitution then comes into being. Uh, does it not? The right to it. You have to bring a jury in there, I suppose. No, Your Honor, I wouldn't bring a jury in. I simply would extend to the man those constitutional rights which the police would at that time take it away from him. Simply so he's begging the question. My question is, what are those rights when this focusing begins? Are these all the panoply of rights guaranteed uh, to a defendant in, the, in, a, in a criminal trial? I think that the first right is the Fifth Amendment right, not to incriminate oneself, the right to know that you have that right, and the right to consult with counsel at the very least, in order that you can exercise the right, Your Honor. Well, I, I don't fully understand your uh, answer, but because if, if the adversary process then begins, then, then what you have is the equivalent of a trial, do you not? And then, I suppose, you have a right to a judge and a jury and everything else that goes through the trial right then and there. And if you have something less than that, then, you, then this is not an adversary proceeding. Then you don't mean what you're saying. I think what I say, what I'm interpreting adversary proceeding to mean, that at that time, a person who is poorly educated, who in essence is mentally abnormal, who is an indigent, to, if he is an adversary proceeding, at the very least, is entitled to, at that stage of the proceeding, <clears throat> to be represented by counsel and to be advised by counsel of his rights under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, or he has no such right. Well, again, I, I, I don't mean to quibble, and I apologize, but I think it's first important to define what those rights are, what his rights under the Constitution are at that point. Uh, you, you can't be advised of his rights unless uh, somebody knows what those rights are. Precisely my, my point, and the only person that can adequately advise a person like Ernest Miranda is a lawyer. And what, what, what would the lawyer advise him that his rights then were? That he had the right not to incriminate himself, that he had a right not to make any statement, that he had the right to be free from further questioning by the police department, that he had the right at an ultimate time to be represented adequately by counsel in court, that if he was too indigent, too poor to employ counsel, that the state would furnish him counsel. <clears throat> and what is it that confers the right to a lawyer's advice at that point and not, and not at an earlier point? The Sixth Amendment? Seat. The Sixth Amendment? No, the attempt to erode or to take away from him the Fifth Amendment right which already existed, and that was the right not to incriminate himself and to be convicted out of his own mind. Well, didn't he have that right earlier? If he knew about it. Before this became a uh, so-called adversary proceeding. Yes, Your Honor, if he knew about it. Why he was he aware of it. He was knowledgeable. Then didn't he have the right to a, a lawyer's advice earlier than that? If he could afford it, yes. He was intelligent enough, strong enough to stand up against police interrogation and request it, yes. What I'm getting at is I don't understand the magic in this phrase of focusing, then all of a sudden it becomes an adversary proceeding, and then I suppose if you literally mean that it becomes an adversary proceeding, then you're entitled to all the rights that a defendant is given under our Constitution at a criminal trial. And if you mean less than that, then, it, then you don't really mean it's now become the equivalent of a trial. Well, I simply mean that when it becomes an adversary proceeding, at the very least, a person in Ernest Miranda's position needs the benefit of counsel. That unless he is afforded that right to counsel, he simply has, in essence, no Fifth or Sixth Amendment right, and there is no due process of law being afforded to a man in Ernest Miranda's position. Well, is it possible that uh, prior to this so-called focusing, or let's say prior to arrest, knowing that those don't mean the same thing, that a citizen has an obligation to cooperate with the state, give the state information uh, that he may have relevant to a crime, that uh, upon arrest or upon this uh, focusing, that uh, 
the state and the individual then assume the position of adversaries, and there is at the very least a change in that uh, relationship between the individual and the state, and therefore in their mutual rights and responsibilities. I don't know whether that's what my brother Stewart's getting at, and perhaps it's unfair to discuss this through you. But if you do have a comment on it, I'd like to hear it. Well, I, I, I think that the only comment that I could make <coughs> is that without getting ourselves into the area of precisely when focusing begins, that I must in this instant limit it to the fact situation and circumstances of Ernest Moran, because for every practical uh, purpose, after the two-hour interrogation, the mere formality of supplying counsel to Ernest Moran at the time of trial and what I would submit would really be nothing more than a mockery of the assertion of his Sixth Amendment rights to be represented in court to go through the formality of a trial and conviction takes place. While this simply is not a matter of the record, uh, it's in the robbery trial, and I think it is so il uh, illustrates the position of what occurs in the case of persons who have confessed as Ernest Miranda. The question was asked in the robbery trial, which preceded the rape trial by one day, of Mr. Moore. The court, are you ready to go to trial? Mr. Moore, I have been ready. I haven't anything to do but from my man and sit down and listen. May I ask you one question, Mr. Sam, that the Fifth Amendment, let's forget that this amendment that provides that no person should be compelled to be a witness in the camp himself. Disassociated entirely from the right to counsel. You said several times, seemed to indicate that in determining whether or not a witness, witness the person could be compelled to commit himself, it might depend to some extent on his literacy or illiteracy, his wealth or his lack of wealth, his standing or his lack of standing. Why does that have anything to do with it? Why does the amendment not, compel, not protect the rich as well as the poor, the literate as well as the illiterate? Well, I'd say that it certainly, most assuredly, does protect what is that? That in the state of the law today, as uh, pronounced by the Arizona Supreme Court, under those guiding principles, it certainly does protect the rich, the educated, and the strong. Those rich enough to hire a counsel, those who are educated enough to know what their rights are, and those who are strong enough to withstand police interrogation and assert those rights. But it I'm does not afford protection. I'm asking you only about the Fifth Amendment provision. No person should be compelled to be a witness against himself. Does that protect every person or just some person? I'm not talking about in practical effect. I'm talking about what the amendment is supposed to do. Protects all persons. Incriminating or convicting Would themselves. Would literacy or illiteracy have anything to do with it if they compelled him to testify? Whatever, that, whatever comes within the scope of that? At the interrogation stage, if he simply is too ignorant to know that he has the Fifth Amendment right, then certainly literacy has something to do with it, Your Honor. If the man at the time of the interrogation has never heard of the Fifth Amendment, knows nothing about its concept or its scope, knows nothing of his right, then certainly his literacy... Uh, You'd have more right because of that? I don't understand. The Fifth Amendment right alone, not to be compelled to be a witness against himself. Who well, does that cover? Perhaps I have simply not expressed myself. Does that cover everybody? It covers everybody, Your Honor. Well, that's what I mean. Clearly, in practical... Uh, application in view of the interrogation and the, uh, uh, the facts and circumstances of Miranda. It simply had no application because of the facts and circumstances in that particular case. And that's what I'm attempting to express to the court. Now, the Arizona Supreme Court went on to, to in essence, we submit, turn its decision primarily on the failure of the defendant in this case to request counsel which is the only really distinguishing factor that they could find. Is there any claim in this case that this uh, confession was uh, compelled, was involuntary? No, Your Honor. None at all? None at all. Do you, mean, do you mean that there's no question that he was not compelled to give evidence of his concern? We have no, raised no question that he was <coughs> compelled to give this statement so in the sense no, that anyone 
forced him to do it by coercion, by threats, by promises, uh, or compulsion of that kind. Well, of that kind, but was, he, was it voluntary or wasn't it? Well, voluntary in the sense that uh, the man uh, at a time, without well, knowledge of his claim, rights... Do you claim his Fifth Amendment rights were violated? I would say that his Fifth Amendment right was violated to the extent... So he was compelled to do it? Because he was compelled to do it? That's what the amendment says. Yes. To the extent that he was, number one, too poor to exercise it, number well, two, mentally the abnormal. Is, whatever the sense is, you say he was compelled to do it. I say it was taken from him at a point in time when he absolutely should have well, been afforded a sixth I'm amendment. I'm not violating the amendment, namely the term, the provision that he was, to violate the amendment, his fifth amendment right, he has to be compelled to do it, doesn't he? In the sense that Your Honor is presenting to me the word compelled, you're correct. You well, know, I was talking about the Constitution. He doesn't have to have a gun pointed at his head, does he? Of course he does. <laughs> so he was compelled to do it, wasn't he? And you, according to your plan? Not by gunpoint, uh, as Mr. Justice Black has indicated. He I was know, called upon he... to surrender a right that he didn't fully realize and appreciate that he had. But in all the circumstances, I'm just trying to find out if you claim that Fifth Amendment rights were violated. And if they, if they were, it must be you compelled, that you say, you're compelled to do it on all the circumstances. I would say that as a result of, of lack of knowledge, of, or lack of a better term, uh, failure to advise, the denial of a right to counsel, the stage of the proceeding when he most certainly needed, needed it, that this could in and of itself. And certainly in most police Why interrogations, the Constitution the compulsion. The state had him in its control and custody. Why would that not tend to show some kind of coercion or compulsion? The whole process of a person having been raised, I would assume, to tell the truth and to respect authority. Was he allowed to get away from there at will? No, Your Honor. He was in confinement and under arrest. The state had moved against him by taking him in to question him, did it not? That is correct. I suppose, I suppose, Mr. Flynn, you would say that uh, if the police had uh, <coughs> said to this young man, now, you're a nice young man, and we don't want to hurt you, and so forth. We're your friends, <clears throat> and uh, if you'll just tell us uh, how you committed this crime, we'll let you go home, and we won't uh, prosecute you. Uh, that, uh, that that would be a violation of the Fifth Amendment, and that, technically speaking, would not be compelling him to do it. It would be an inducement, wouldn't it? That's correct. But it would, uh, I suppose you would argue that that is still uh, within the Fifth Amendment, wouldn't you? It's an abdication of the Fifth Amendment yeah. right simply because that's, of that's, that's what I mean. the total circumstances existing at the time. The Fact arrest, that. the custody, uh, the lack of knowledge, the status of the individual. we have held <coughs> cases of that kind that confessions are bad, haven't we? But they said it'd be better for you if you do, we'll let you go, well, and so forth. That, of course, is an implied promise of yes. some help or immunity. That is strictly a uh, That certainly is not compulsion. Uh, we've been talking about it. In the sense, the word is Mr. Justice White has applied it. As I recall, in those cases, I agree with the Chief Judge. As I recall, in those cases that were put on the fifth, under the Fifth Amendment, and the word for the Fifth Amendment was referred to in the early case by Chief Justice White, I believe it was. Uh, the fact that inducement is a compulsion and was, was brought in that category. Therefore, it violated the amendment against being compelled to give evidence against yourself. I'm sure Mr. Justice Black is so it's a far better question of what, compel, what compel means. What does not depend, I suppose, I haven't seen it in any of the cases, on the wealth, or the standing, or the status of the person so far as the right is concerned. Yes, I think perhaps that was a bad choice of words and context. <laughs> Your Honor, please, at the time I state them. I would like to state that uh, in conclusion, that the Constitution of the state of Arizona, for example, has since statehood provided to the citizens of our state uh, language precisely the same as the Fourth Amendment of the federal Constitution as it pertains to searches and seizures. And yet from 1914 until this court's decision in Mapp versus Ohio, we simply did not enjoy the 
Fourth Amendment rights, or the scope of the Fourth Amendment rights, that were enjoyed by most of the citizens of the other states of this union and those persons <coughs> who were under federal control. In response to the amicus from New York and for the amicus for the uh, National Association of Defense Attorneys that would ask this court to go slowly and to give the uh, opportunity to the states, to the legislature, to the courts, and to the Bar Association to undertake to solve this problem. I simply say that whatever the solutions may be, it would be another 46 years before the Sixth Amendment right, in the scope that it was intended, I submit, by this court in Escobedo, will reach the state of Arizona. We're one of the most modern states in relation to the adoption of the American Law Institute rules. We have a comparable rule to Rule 5. But to my knowledge, there has never been a criminal prosecution for failure to arraign a man. And there is no decision in Arizona that would even come come close to the McNabb or Mallory rules in Arizona. In fact, the same term that Miranda was decided, the Arizona Supreme Court indicated that despite <coughs> the necessity and requirement of an immediate arraignment before the nearest and most accessible magistrate, that Mallory versus McNabb did not apply. <coughs> Mr. Nelson. Chief Justice, may it please the court, counsel, somewhat caught up in where to begin. I think perhaps the first and most important, to one of the most important things to say right now is concerning Mr. Flynn's last remarks. I, as a prosecutor, even of only short duration, take serious issues as strenuous, as strenuous issue as I can take before this court in the statement that it will take another 46 years in the state of Arizona for the right to counsel to become full-blown. Uh, I just simply think there's no reason for that statement to be made. If there's any reason for it to be made, uh, any possible justification for it to be made, then there's no point in, uh, in going any further. Uh, uh, one issue that might be a good starting point is concerning the description of the Arizona court's supposed uh, off-the-cuff referral to or ignoring of the Escobedo decision or the attempt to avoid it clearly. Uh, there is no such thing in the Arizona Supreme Court opinion, and a reading of it shows that. They agree that they must follow this court, not begrudgingly. They simply state it, that it's a fact. And then in exploring the case of Escobedo, the case of Miranda, they try to find out what happened in Miranda, what the case of Escobedo says, and apply those principles. Uh, there's, uh, there's no attempt to avoid and I don't think you can read it implicitly or otherwise in the Arizona court's opinion. Clearly, they did not base it on a request. They did not say, uh, we have A, B, C, D, E, uh, D wasn't present, therefore it's not controlling. That was not what they said. They said many courts in other jurisdictions had gone off on that uh, particular area. They mentioned that as a factor, but they discussed hundreds of, uh, not hundreds, but many other factors in Miranda which differentiated it from Escobedo. To get to the facts in Miranda, uh, I think it's very clear from the record that Mr. Miranda, as an individual defendant, does not particularly require any special rules. I certainly agree with Mr. Justice Black 100% that the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, every other part of our Constitution applies to everyone, poor, rich, ignorant, intellectual, what have you. There's no possible basis for differentiation. I don't argue that. I don't think any prosecutor of note argues it. Uh, but Miranda, I think, characteristically by the petitioner, is portrayed in this light uh, in an attempt to make something that isn't there. Sure, he only went through the eighth grade. And uh, one of the psychiatrists said he uh, had an emotional illness. Uh, I might say, uh, 
There is another psychiatric report. It's not in the printed record, and I just discovered in my file. Uh, but it is in the record before this court, the record that was formed on appeal, and I would urge the court to advert to that psychiatric report also. And as to the fact that Mr. Miranda could not have made the statement that he made, I just don't think there's any basis for alleging that. The fact that he uses the words, uh, the medical words, to describe the uh, male and female sex organ rather than the some four-letter vernacular words that he might have, have used. This doesn't condemn him uh, uh, just because he knew those words and maybe felt in this context in writing a statement that uh, he could use them. Uh, there's no indication in the record that the police put these words in his mouth. The fact that uh, this particular one-half-inch penetration uh, is something that the police conjured up in his mind is just simply not supportable by the record. You read the psychiatric report and uh, it, that is in the record. And he, he said he was uh, upset when he found out that she had not had sexual relations before. Well, she told him that. The only way he found out was because, uh, obviously from the record, uh, as he said, he uh, was only able to make penetration uh, only a slight ways, simply because of the fact that, uh, that the woman's hymen had not been ruptured. This is a a clear factual as to that he knew why he made that statement and why it was accurate, not a fabrication of the police officers. Mr. Nelson, on page 19 of your brief, you uh, assert that the petitioner was advised of his constitutional rights, specifically including his right to remain silent, the fact that his statement had to be voluntary, and that anything he did say could be used against him. Yes, Your Honor. I wouldn't Is have... the only basis for that the uh, printed legend in the confession that he signed? No. I, I don't believe I would have put in as strong a statement concerning his right to remain silent had not uh, we agreed to stipulate to this other portion of the other record. Uh, but I believe that as long as that's in the record, I can make this statement because it's supported in the finding of the court based on the interrogation of the officers, of the testimony of the officers in the trial that is actually before this court concerning their advice to him uh, and the findings of the court based on his understanding, the reading of the statement, the testimony coupled with this, I believe then that the court below, which clearly found that to be true, that he had been fully advised, uh, had a proper basis for finding all these to exist, except that there is no quarrel, uh, that he was not specifically advised that he had a right to come. Is it your position that uh, the record shows that he was advised of these uh, uh, rights somehow, some way, in addition to the legend on his confession? That's my question. Yes. And uh, how, where is that? I believe the police officers testify to the fact that they told him uh, of his rights and that they also, besides telling him, uh, perhaps it, the record is a little unclear uh, in both cases uh, as to exactly when it took place, but I believe the record supports a statement that he was advised specifically by them of his rights and then he was adverted to the paragraph and perhaps even again the paragraph was read to him, but it, the record is not really all four square. It's not that clear. All right. Let us assume that he was so advised, and I understand you said that the record is not clear on the point. Let us assume that he was advised of these rights. In your opinion, does it make any difference when he was advised, that is, uh, whether he was advised at the commencement of the interrogation or in an early stage of the interrogation, or uh, whether he was advised uh, only when uh, he was ready to sign the confession, the written confession. Does well, that make any difference in terms of the issues uh, before us? Assuming for a moment that, that some uh, warning is going to be required or should have been given or is it, then I would think uh, to be of any effect that must be given before he'd made any statement. Uh, uh, 
perhaps he might have refused to sign a written confession. Certainly still the oral statements could have been introduced against him. So you, <clears throat> you think that the uh, warning, if necessary, has to be given prior to the interrogation? At some meaningful time, right? I think it has to be at some time pr prior to the fact that uh, that after if they use it before, of course, the warning would mean nothing. If they could introduce what they had obtained from him before they gave the warning and, and what afterwards. Well, now, do you believe that, uh, is it your submission to us, that a warning is necessary before a <coughs> confession in the absence of counsel can be taken and subsequently introduced in the trial? No. What is your position on that? No, my position basically is concerning the warning uh, is that each case presents a factual situation in which the court would have to determine, or a court, or a judge, or a prosecutor at some level would have to make a determination as whether or not a defendant, because of the circumstances surrounding his confession, uh, was denied a specific right, whether it be a right to counsel, the right to not be compelled to testify against himself. And that a warning, or an age, or a, uh, literacy, the circumstances, length of questioning, all these factors would be important. But I don't think you can pin it to one simple uh, thing as a warning, because uh, there are perhaps many situations we could think of where a warning uh, would be completely inadequate. Well, uh Tell me some of the factors that would be relevant in the absence of a warning. Uh, his age, his experience, his background, the type of questioning, the atmosphere of the questioning, the length of questioning, time of the time of day, perhaps. <clears throat> All these factors. Do you think well, what we ought to do is to devise something like the Betts and Brady rule, special circumstances? Well, I think that's what the, the Escobedo case indicates. In other words, I, I'm, of course, my opinion is biased, and uh, I'm, if, it, if it is not something like that, then it's an, it's an absolute uh, right to counsel. I don't think there can be any in-between unless some other theory, uh, under the way I read the decisions of this court, that it's, if it is an absolute right to counsel, the same sort of right to counsel that attaches no, we're not talking about right to counsel now, we're talking about the warning. When is a warning necessary? And as I understand you, you uh, say that if the warning is necessary, if it should be held to be constitutionally necessary in the absence of counsel, then the warning has to be given at a meaningful time. I would think so, certainly. Yeah. And then I proceeded to ask you uh, to give us a benefit of your views as to whether a warning was necessary, and as I understand it, you say that you have to look at the circumstances yes. of each case. I would say not absolutely. Now I'm asking, and then I ask you what the circumstances of each case, what are the relevant circumstances to look for in a particular case? <clears throat> and uh, how about this, this particular case? Uh, is the psychiatric report to which you referred, psychiatric report number two, and material variance with the one that, uh, to which uh, are... I don't think so. I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't say it. I don't think, I think both reports say in the effect that uh, the man has a, an emotional illness that should be treated, <coughs> but that he knew what was going on. Uh, both the reports say his mental faculties, whatever they were, were sharp, acute. He had no, uh, no psychotic disorders. I think they're both, they both say basically the same thing. Uh, I think the diagnosis in the other report was a sociopathic personality. So that if the Betts against Brady test uh, were applied in the way that this court did apply it uh, prior to Gideon, I suppose it's quite arguable that uh, Miranda, the petitioner here, was entitled to a warning. <laughs> Would you agree? Well, it's that? arguable. I have uh, extensively argued the facts that that he wasn't of such a nature uh, as an individual because of his mental condition or his uh, educational background as to require any more than he got. He got every, in other words, I'm saying he got every warning except 
the right, the warning, the specific warning of the right to counsel. He didn't have counsel. Counsel wasn't specifically denied to him uh, on the basis of a request to retain counsel. The only possible thing that happened to Mr. Miranda that, in my light, assuming that he has the capability of understanding it all, is the fact that he did not get the specific warning of his right to counsel. Well, even if we assume that he got all the other warnings, and putting aside the question of right to counsel, mm -hmm. assuming that the uh, record does show that he got these warnings, it's still, uh, is there any evidence? Uh, I have to ask you again, uh, uh, does the record show that he got it at uh, what you would call a meaningful time? Yes, I think the police officers, they were never pinned down as to when, in other words, whether at 11.30 when they went into interrogation room two, they immediately warned him. This was never pinned down by either side, but they did say that he was warned, and then they went to elaborate that he was warned specifically, as I believe, as my recollection serves me correct, in, in response to a specific question concerning the statement, they said he was, the part of the statement was read to him again. Again, now I, I believe that the court could find from the record that he was warned at 11.30. If the warning is required in this particular case to protect his rights and, and, and it's found, as a matter of fact, which the court below did not find, that it was not given until uh, the written statement, and I would suppose that uh, it wasn't given at the proper time. Mr. Nelson, I certainly want your views and only your views, and I don't want to state anything unfairly. But uh, I wonder, uh, am I correct in inferring from what you have just said next to my questions that the state of Arizona does agree that there are occasions when the United States Constitution requires that uh, a warning as to the right to remain silent uh, uh, must be given your Honor, to I defend to a person who's in custody, and it, and it must be given at a meaningful time. Do I correctly state the uh, position that you're uh, presenting to us here? Not, not completely. I don't think that the Arizona Supreme Court has worded its holdings, and I cite, the course, court the case that followed Miranda and referred back to it concerning the point to waiver and they go on to expand on their thinking. I don't believe the Arizona court has specifically said that warnings as such are of a constitutional dimension. The court has said that in some cases, warnings may be required in a, in a given case. In fact, in the Goff case, which I cite as the next case in the Arizona court's determination, they say it's important uh, that the uh, that all steps be taken at the earliest possible time when they're indicated by the fact situation to ensure that the state doesn't overreach and that the man is given every benefit of his rights under the Constitution. But I don't believe they've yet said as a constitutional dimension any specific warning at any specific situation uh, needs to be given. Yeah, it's my, it's my argument uh, concerning uh, the factors surrounding Escobedo that if Escobedo is a s completely distinct and separate determination of a Sixth Amendment right as divorced from a Fifth Amendment right, which I think is, is pretty hard to do. Then, in order for it to be meaningful and effective, not just to the defendants, but to the, the people uh, of the state, of the country, it's got to announce a rule which forbids affirmative conduct on the, basis, on the basis of police officers or prosecutors uh, calculated in a given situation to deny the man the implementation of his right, whether it be the right to counsel or the right uh, against compulsory self-incrimination. As I understand it, there's no right not to incriminate himself. Uh, the right is for him not to be compelled, whether it's subtle compulsion or direct, but it is still a right not to be compelled to incriminate himself. At least this is this is my understanding. And, and he doesn't have a right not to self not to incriminate himself. He has a right not to be compelled to incriminate himself by some means, either direct or devious. <coughs> now, I think 
if the extreme position is adopted that says he has to either have counsel at this stage or intelligently waive counsel, that uh, a serious problem in the enforcement of our criminal law will occur. Uh, first of all, let us make one thing certain. We need no empirical data as to one factor. What counsel will do if he is actually introduced. I'm talking now about counsel for the defendant. There, at least among lawyers, there can be no doubt as to what counsel for the defendant is to do. He is to represent him 100%. Uh, win, lose, or draw, guilty or innocent, that's our system. And when counsel is introduced at interrogation, uh, interrogation ceases. Why? Immediately. Why? Well, for one reason, uh, first of all, let's assume an unfamiliar, I mean, there are several different situations, but assuming counsel is immediately introduced and he knows nothing about the case, he's not talked to his defendant, he's appointed, say. He's appointed to an indigent, an indigent defendant who says, I want a lawyer. I need a lawyer right now. I don't want to talk to you without a lawyer. He's given a lawyer. <laughs> he talks to the defendant. Well, first of all, he stops the interrogation until he can talk to the defendant. I would think he, if he's going to represent him, he cannot uh, allow him to say anything until he finds out what his story is, what he's going to stay, is going to, how it's going to affect him. So the interrogation immediately would stop for that purpose. And then after he has had an opportunity to confer with his client, let's assume another thing. Let's just, uh, assume his client said, yes, I did it. I'm guilty. Uh, had all the requisite intents. He, he, makes a statement to his lawyer in confidence that he did it and asks his lawyer what he should do. What he should do. Well, the lawyer uh, maybe doesn't know his past history. Maybe the lawyer would want to find out what the police have if he can. And so maybe more time would, uh, in order to properly represent him, would be taken up here, uh, time which there would be no interrogation. Well, let's further assume that he advises his client. Well, uh, I think you ought to confess. I think there's a possibility for a light sentence. You did it. They have... Uh, other evidence, or maybe they don't have any other evidence. Let's say they don't have any other evidence, and uh, you can confess. And the fellow says, well, I don't want to confess. I don't want to go to the gas chamber if I don't have to. Is there, is there anything else that you as my lawyer can do for me? Well, what has he got to tell him? That I, under our system, he's got to tell him, yes, you don't have to say anything. There's a, and the fact that you don't say anything can not in any way hurt you, be inferred otherwise, and we can put the state to its burden of proof. And uh, why does our system compel his lawyer to do that? Well, as I and understand it, compelled by our system to do that. Yes, I'm sure. I it's my understanding that he is. Well, why does it do it? Who's for what purpose? What's the object of that? But on the part of the lawyer? Because we believe that it's right and proper that the criminal defendant not be deprived of his life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And something about giving testimony against himself. Right, this is, but I mean, in, this is just the one issue where the, the lawyer has to guard all these rights. But I'm saying the practical effect of introducing counsel at the interrogation stage is going to stop the interrogation for any and all purposes except what counsel decides will be in the best interests of his defendant. Otherwise, the, counsel will not be doing his job. Isn't that about the same thing as a practical effect and object of the amendment which says he should not be compelled to give evidence against himself? Is there any difference between the objects uh, and purposes of the two, what the lawyer tells him and what the, the, the amendment? Well, oh, certainly that's is. the object of what his, his lawyer is telling him. Well, it, isn't that the object of the amendment? It, well, that is the question. Whether it's... Uh, of course, his, the Fifth Amendment he has a right never to be compelled to incriminate himself at whatever stage. And this is, of course, involving him a knowledgeable implementation of that right at this time if he wants to. What I'm saying is that the state does not have to, at this stage, insist on that right being enforced or waived because you be pre-trial police interrogation does more than just develop confessions or incrimin it, it develops incriminating statements. It develops exculpatory statements which pin a story down to a defendant very closely after the crime has been committed or very closely after he's been taken in police custody which prevent uh, or effectively uh, make it 
unprofitable for him to perjure himself or change his testimony at the trial. Is anything fantastic in the idea that the Fifth Amendment, that the protection against being compelled to testify against oneself might be read reasonably as meaning there should be no pre-trial proceedings when he was there in the possession of the, the state? Well, of course, I don't, I don't, to me, I think there is. I think there's a valid interest. Uh, well, there's a valid interest, of course, if they can convict him and more, that's their business to try to convict him. Right, but I think that, well, and this is another argument that, that I think must be made. Our adversary system as such is not <coughs> completely adversary even at the trial stage in a criminal prosecution because canon five of the uh, canons of ethics of the American Bar Association which are law in Arizona by rule of court says that the dual duty of the prosecution is not simply to go out and convict but is to see that justice is done I, I know I've talked to many prosecutors myself and in my short time I've gotten as much satisfaction out of the cases in which I was compelled to confess error in a case where a man has been deprived of his uh, rights by due process, and I got the satisfaction in being upheld in a, in a tight case. You, in give, court. Uh, you give defendants access to the uh, state's uh, evidence against them in your state? Uh, Mr. Flynn would tell you more about that at the uh, trial level. I don't believe uh, that the rule has been interpreted very broadly. I think it's been interpreted narrowly. I think he can get his own statements, and perhaps he can get police officers' reports uh, there is a rule providing for uh, motions, but the judges, as I understand it, have construed so that, uh, fairly narrowly. So that it is uh, possible to uh, speculate, isn't it, that the uh, state has limitations, places limitations upon its obligation to cooperate with the uh, defendant as witness the uh, denial of uh, discovery to the defendant discovery of the evidence that the state has against him. Yes. Of course, I, I'm sure the prosecutors would 100% go along with the full discovery for both sides, but with this, what? With, yeah. with, full, with full discovery for both sides, but this maybe, is... Maybe, maybe the prosecutors that you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this would do by the defendant. The defendant, of course, is compelled to no discovery. No ordinary discovery procedures in the in the uh, scope we think of them in a civil case. So I I, I just say this today. I'm not sure the analogy is completely. The only, the only point I was calling your attention is that uh, there are uh, in our system uh, there are limitations upon the degree of cooperativeness on both sides. It's not just that the uh, arrested person has under the Constitution a privilege against self-incrimination. It is also that the state, uh, when it assumes an adversary position, even before that time, uh, takes advantage of certain uh, uh, reticences, shall I say, with yes. respect to disclosure yes. to the accused. Sure, it does, but uh, there is no compulsion. In fact, compulsion is to the contrary on the defense side to cooperate, whereas the, there is complete compulsion uh, at least by my interpretation of the law, for the prosecutor to do as much if it's available to him to show that the defendant's innocent is to prove his guilty. Well, I, th I think we've established in this colloquy that it, that it doesn't always work that way. Is, is a little bit of an overstatement. It doesn't always work that way. I, I'm sure that's the case. But this, here again, is, is another point that I emphasize. This is no reason, I don't think, for a constitutional rule which would, in effect, uh, take care of what I consider to be the exceptions to the rule rather than the general practice. Uh, I might just say, since I noticed my time is about up, uh, counsel made a statement to the effect in answer to a question of one of the justices, I forget which one, something about that uh, why Miranda talked that maybe he was raised to tell the truth or our society, you're raised to tell the truth and respect authority. This brings in another thing into play, I believe, which is vitally important, and, and the prosecutors in my state consider it so, that if, in fact, in fact, you either have counsel or you don't, and it thereby seriously circumscribes interrogation and confession, you eliminate an early part of one of the most important principles, hopefully, in our criminal law, and that is to, not just to convict, not just to deter, not just to put somebody away, but to rehabilitate and at the earliest possible moment, and 
Uh, I don't have that many personal experiences, so a meet, we had a meeting with the prosecutors in our state, and uh, many of the cases uh, involving confessions and pretrial interrogation uh, were the cases where, where a man has at least admitted he's done something wrong, were cases where, where the defendants uh, were much more uh, susceptible to rehabilitation at this stage. And if you foreclose this and you develop an attitude in the police officers, uh, you take a personal attitude away. Many a hardened police officer, when he's developed a case of uh, tremendous circumstantial evidence against a man, and yet the man sits there and keeps telling him, I didn't do it, uh, he is going to wonder, there's a personal factor there, he's going to wonder, well, why doesn't this man confess? Why doesn't he uh, say something about doing it? Even assuming now, arguendo, that it's not coercion, that we, uh, I have no argument that whatever is considered coercion, whether it's subtle or otherwise, should not be used, but assuming that the interrogation is good except for that, uh, he's going to wonder, and maybe he's going to go out and, and examine that eyewitness who saw him at 2 o'clock in the morning under a dark street light and, and examine his other evidence because he wonders that personal element, he, he ought to confess. He, here's all the evidence. It's a prima facie case. This is wiped out completely if you terribly circumscribed this particular pretrial investigation. This particular personal element is out. And he can say, well, I got the evidence. Maybe he's guilty, maybe he's not. I didn't talk to him. I don't know how he acts, how he, how he uh, turns up. And I think its defendants uh, could be hurt as much as the, uh, as the prosecution. General Taylor. Justice, members of the court. Uh, the state of New York is uh, appearing not only in the present case, uh, the Miranda case, but in the ensuing four cases that have been scheduled for executive arguments in which these problems of the right to the assistance of counsel are raised. Uh, I think the state has appeared here as amicus on uh, numerous previous occasions when there has been a constitutional question in the general field of criminal procedure. The uh, nature of our interest is stated in the opening statement of the brief, and I do not believe that I need to elaborate that orally. Excuse me. I should add that the brief has been uh, circulated uh, to the other states and has been joined by something over half, I think about 27 other states, as well as Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Now, I'll try to say what I have to say in, in less than the allotted time, and uh, my task of brevity is the easier because some things I might otherwise say I think will be said much better by others. And I'll also try to say a few things that, as I read the briefs, no one else is going to say, or at least they say in the same manner. Uh, the factor common to all five of these cases uh, is that a confession is received in evidence uh, which was taken uh, when counsel were not present and when there had been no waiver of counsel. And therefore, a contention that runs commonly through all five of them uh, is the one that uh, emerged, I think, most clearly in answer to Justice Black's question uh, as to whether this is a matter of constitutional dimension under the Fifth Amendment or, for that matter, the Sixth or the Due Process Clause. Uh, if I, I may say... You, if it's Pardon? you said one thing common. Is there another thing common as to where they were when the confessions were made? Well, the cases, uh, well, they're all in detention. That's also all true. What? All in, de in a state of detention. Yes. Uh, otherwise than that, there is quite a spectrum of circumstances that this, these cases uh, reveal. The, other, the surrounding circumstances are not, not uniform. Now, may I just state what the thrust of our position is very briefly before... Uh, indicating likewise its limits and why we are taking this position. Uh, our contention is that insofar as these cases present a constitutional claim uh, that a valid confession cannot be taken unless counsel is present or has been waived, uh, that that claim in constitutional terms, in the constitutional dimension, uh, is not sound. In other words, Justice Black's question we would answer in the negative that the Fifth Amendment uh, cannot be, uh, should not be, read as requiring counsel to be present at the time the confession is taken. I will come to my reasons for that very presently. Uh, our secondary position is that if the court should uh, decide to enunciate 
a rule of that sort in constitutional terms or uh, other new rules uh, pertaining to the validity of prearrangement confessions. Uh, those should not be applied retroactively, but should be perspective only. Now, before speaking in, in support of those two positions, and I intend to spend most of my time on the first one, uh, may I make clear uh, the, uh, the limits of our position here and what we are not saying, because I think this is of almost equal importance. Uh, we are not taking any position for either affirmance or reversal of any of these five cases. Uh, that is because all five of them, as we see it, involve problems or possible problems that that go beyond the limits of our contention here. Uh, in the Miranda case, it's just been argued. Uh, there is obvious division of opinion about the characteristics of the defendant, uh, about whether the warning that Mr. Justice Fortas's questions were directed to uh, was given at a meaningful stage, what the significance of that warning is in legal terms. Uh, the other five cases involve questions of trial procedure in which we are not presently interested. Uh, they also, two of them involve a period of long detention from which counsel are making arguments derived from the McNabb-Mallory uh, uh, principles. Uh, we are not uh, taking a position on those matters, and therefore we could not uh, say that in any one of these five cases we are supporting uh, an affirmance or a reversal. Secondly, uh, may I make quite clear that we are not saying that new rules about uh, requiring counsel to be present when an, inter when an investigation is taken, uh, interrogation is made, or confession taken, we are not saying that such rules are necessarily uh, unwise, uh, without merit. Uh, we say that these are not matters of constitutional dimension, but we do not say that they might not be very wise rules to adopt. In fact, we are saying that this whole problem of the assistance of counsel at the pre-arraignment stage uh, can, we think, uh, be more appropriately and perhaps better dealt with uh, in the legislative dimension and in the area of judicial policy rather than in purely constitutional terms. Now, of course, insofar as we say there's no constitutional basis here, our position cuts against the, uh, the defendants. But as I repeat, uh, we are not taking a position against uh, such rules uh, found in other ways, through legislative means, through uh, judicial policy or otherwise. Now, may it please the court, the inclusion in these five cases of one federal case, uh, the Westover case, number 761, uh, I think underlines this uh, distinction that I have been endeavoring to state. And it also discloses uh, the one respect in which I think our position uh, departs from that that's taken by the Solicitor General. Uh, as a federal case, uh, this being a, a confession taken by federal agents and introduced in evidence uh, in a federal prosecution, I would suppose that the Westover case is susceptible of disposition in, uh, in non-constitutional terms under this court's uh, federal supervisory jurisdiction uh, as enunciated in, uh, in the McNabb-Mallory uh, cases and that general line of authority. Uh, as I read the Solicitor General's brief, however, he is, he is saying not only that the Constitution does not raise a requirement of the presence of counsel, uh, but is also saying that such a rule should not be uh, laid down by this court uh, as a matter of uh, judicial policy in the way it was done in McNabb and Mallory. Our position does not extend to that second step. Uh, we do not take any position one way or the other on it. Uh, I think it's entirely appropriate to say, though, uh, that that would be a dimension in which we would consider uh, this court might very appropriately uh, deal with the matter. One can we further do this thing with I'm respect, I beg your pardon, can we do that uh, with respect to uh, the states? No, I, no, Mr. Justice Fortas, I was pointing out that the Westover case uh, brings out, that. it's only in the Westover case that you can do that. So course. what you're saying is that we might uh, lay down such a rule some way, somehow, short of constitutional basis. Right, right for the federal courts and leave the states alone. That's what it comes down to. Well, uh, that's correct. Uh, the states are, of course, affected only by the constitutional dimension. The federal courts are subject to a broader range of review. Uh, I might add that in New York, uh, our own Court of Appeals has, uh, uh, has uh, noted and acted upon uh, uh, 
uh, this very distinction between decisions in the constitutional dimension and, consider and decisions in the domain of judicial policy. Well, what's the difference between this uh, problem in those terms and the problem that uh, this court handled in Gideon? Problem of right to counsel. Well, if your honor is asking whether the what the reasons for drawing a distinction between the trial stage and the pretrial stage may be. Uh, and, 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 and yes, in the terms of what you're discussing. In other words, would New York State have taken the position that uh, Gideon was uh, wrongly decided? Wrongly decided, no. Uh, and indeed, in New York State, uh, this would be treated now as a matter of constitutional requirement. Uh, there's no question about that in my mind. Uh, but in the, in, now, in the dimension we're talking about, that is the pre-arraignment right to counsel. Uh, New York State held prior to Escobedo, Mr. Justice Fortas, uh, that where, as in Escobedo, there is a, an interference by the police authorities uh, with the access of counsel to his client, uh, that this was, in the constitutional dimension, uh, a violation of the defendant's rights. Uh, this case is cited with approval in the Escobedo decision. Uh, just last year, it went further than that, the Court of Appeals, uh, and held that if there is a, um, a telephone call from counsel to the police authorities asking that there be no more questioning of uh, the client, uh, that uh, any questioning that takes place after that cannot result in admissible admissions or confessions. But when the further question was raised, uh, in a case where counsel arrived at the station, while a confession was being taken, uh, the state made the contention that that part of the confession that took place before counsel arrived could be admitted, and not the latter part. General, I don't want to take any more of your time. I just want to say that I think the problem is uh, whether it's not too late in the day to make that kind of extinction. I'm asking a question. That is to say that once this court has uh, made the rulings that it has made in Gideon and Escobedo, I wonder if uh, it's still uh, of much avail to argue that we ought to draw the kind of a line that you're suggesting here. Well, that brings me back to Mr. Justice Black's question in its relation to the ones that, uh, that you have been putting, Mr. Justice Fortas, uh, and that is whether there is anything in the Constitution, uh, either in the Sixth Amendment, Assistance of Counsel Clause, in the Due Process Clause, or in the Protection Against Self-Incrimination, whether any of those clauses together or conjointly uh, should be read uh, as requiring counsel in the pre-arraignment stage. Now, it seems to me that uh, if one is going to approach that question, uh, one must uh, enunciate a constitutional theory. Uh, are we looking to history and original meaning of the Constitution, or are we looking to uh, contemporary standards? Is the Constitution to be treated as fluid, uh, with, uh, with different and perhaps more rigorous meanings uh, obtaining by common consent at a later time, or are we to look to the uh, original understanding, as it has been called? Now, I suggest with all respect, Mr. Justice Fortas, that in those terms, uh, it's very difficult uh, to support the contentions being made here, and the situation is quite different from Gideon, quite different. Uh, I forget the exact number of states uh, that already were furnishing counsel uh, in all criminal trials at the time of Gideon. But my recollection is there wasn't more than a handful that weren't already doing this as a matter of state practice. Uh, therefore, one had a, a very broad practice and consensus uh, in the states on this very point. The same thing, if I may say so, uh, was true in the MAP case to a lesser extent. Uh, in MAP, you had about half the states that who were applying the exclusionary rule uh, and the trend was solidly in that direction. California had changed its view between Wolf and Map, so that in both of these situations, you had a solid basis in practical experience in the states, and really your decision was not revolutionary in those terms. But in the dimension that we're now talking about, I don't know of a single state that presently excludes confessions that are taken pre-arraignment under the absence of counsel. I don't think there is such a jurisdiction <laughs> But it doesn't, isn't it a fact that most of the states have a, uh, a regulation that a prisoner shall be taken forthwith to, uh, before a magistrate and they're advised of his rights uh, and so forth? And doesn't practically every state in the Union have a, have a, a, a clause uh, uh, preventing 
people from being compelled to testify against themselves. Indeed, that is helpless, Chief Justice, yes. And uh, so in that respect, we're not much different than Gideon, are we? Well, they weren't, there, there are just an awful lot of states that weren't, uh, weren't uh, uh, giving counsel up to the time of Gideon. They uh, had a rule on it, maybe, but they weren't, they weren't according to counsel. My understanding is that at the time of Gideon, all but a very few states were indeed according full right to counsel at the trial stage, which is what Gideon related to. And what I'm saying is that we have no such basis in precedent and established practice when we are coming to the prearrangement stage. Nor do we have constitutional doctrine. That's uh, something that indicates wisdom. But that's not the same thing as saying that that is uh, that uh, that's not addressed to the question of historical interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, no, indeed. Uh, on the basis of historical interpretation, I think one would be hard put to it to find any basis for finding the right to counsel at the prearrangement stage, much less the right to be furnished counsel if you are indigent. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me the stronger argument for the uh, claim advanced here is not the historical basis, but the common consensus basis. And it is on that basis I was suggesting, Mr. Justice Fortas, that we, we don't have the Gideon situation here at all. This court is being asked to enunciate a rule for which there is no uh, basis in the prevalent practice. Gideon, there was no claim made that there was the result that achieved uh, uh, around that in Gideon was based on a historical interpretation of the Constitution. It's based upon a reinterpretation of the general constitutional guarantee. And for that reinterpretation, there was abundant support in what one could see around one, and a commonly accepted view that this was a very desirable thing. We don't have that here. Thank you, Mr. Chief. General, General you, ha you haven't gotten to your second point, and there are only two or three minutes until closing time, would you mind addressing yourself to that on the question of retroactivity? On retroactivity. Well, actually, Mr. Chief Justice, that point flows, I would think, as a matter of logic, from our first proposition, if that be accepted. If, as we see it, this is not a constitutional claim based on an original understanding, if this is a matter that will be evolved from contemporary practice and changing standards, uh, why then, it seems to me that to apply such a rule retroactively uh, presents considerable conceptual difficulties. And I find no conceptual difficulties in a prospective application. The court has confronted this now twice in Linkletter and uh, in Tian. Uh, we have set out in our brief the reasons why it seems to us the considerations the court went on there uh, are applicable here. I might say also that, uh, that if we are to, uh, to hope for legislative progress and for uh, action within the states, by their own courts, uh, why a principle of retroactivity may be a damper on change and uh, improvement rather than a stimulus to it. This would tend to freeze things and make people reluctant to develop new practices that if everything else has to be unwound going all the way back to the beginning uh, to make the new practice prevail. Very well. <coughs> The Supreme Court decided that suspects must be advised of their rights upon arrest and before interrogation begins. Opportunities to exercise these rights must be available to the suspect throughout the interrogation. These rights have come to be known as the Miranda rights. Chief Justice Earl Warren delivered the opinion of the court in Miranda versus Arizona.